any light? No? Speaking loud today? Uh, I don't, is that working better? Oh, yeah. I need to bend that. I hope they can bend. Are we getting there now? Thank you. Anyways, yes, good to see everyone here today. Someone's obviously missing today, Ryan and his family. Um, Owen has COVID. He's uh, wiped out a little bit, but he's going to do okay. Nobody else has uh, got any symptoms at this point, but uh, they decided they needed to stay home today. So we'll pray for them. Uh, and we're, wonder, we're grateful to have Laura Barron here today with uh, Jews for Jesus. And uh, she's going to show us a bunch of the Jewish tradition today. And uh, there's going to be a second offering at the end of the service, a love offering for Jews for Jesus. So just keep that in mind. Be prepared for that. And I want to invite Bethany up. She has an announcement to make. wherever you want. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we are, oh, I'm Bethany, and we're part of a community now on Facebook for Mama's Mingle, and it's, you can join us. We are a private group, and you will have to send a friend request to ask to join. Um, you can see us on Facebook as the Mama's Mingle, and we would be excited to see you on April Friday 1st at 1 p.m. here. And we are excited to start community conversations, connections, and your children are welcome. All right. Thank you, Beth. Uh, from April 10th to the 18th, April is coming up here soon. We're going to have out in the back there uh, the Stations of the Cross. So make sure you take opportunity. It'll be from Sunday to the following Sunday, the 18th. Okay. Um, and we're excited about the, ho uh, the soccer registration. It is open now. You can go online and just look for the Rec Soccer re uh, registration page. And... Uh, Hopefully, we're going to have lots of activity out in our backyard there. Continue to remind everybody about our Wednesday night. There's something for everybody. There's a prayer group here. There's fellowship in the foyer, the senior youth, and, uh, and the kids club going on too. So everybody's welcome for the Wednesday night. Right after the service today, and we really encourage you to stay, is our council meeting and... Uh, we want uh, to be, we need to do a vote on, uh, I think, on the budget. So uh, the more people we have here, the better. Let's open our service in prayer. We thank you, God, for your unfailing, everlasting, enduring love for us, your children. We are so grateful to be here to worship together today. And we pray your blessing on all aspects of this service, Lord, and may you be lifted up and glorified. We do pray for Pastor Ryan and Melanie and their kids, and we pray, Lord, that uh, they are well again soon, and that even in the, the difficulties of this trial, that they are rejoicing that uh, you are their Father in heaven and your care for them. In the name of Jesus, our God, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Why don't you stand with us? And uh, it's great to see you here on this nice spring morning. No, seriously, did spring not get the memo? This is not okay. So, You guys know this song really, really well, so you don't even need to look up here. So what I'd rather you guys do is maybe there's some people here you haven't seen in a long time. So why don't you take a moment and say hi to some people as we sing. <laughs>
it out this morning.
him up this morning. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory pray that you would come here this morning, God, and just enter this place and let, fill us with you, God, this morning. I pray that you would just move us and that we could sense your presence here this morning as we worship. Cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree, his body bowed and drenched in tears, and laid him down in Joseph's
Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated except for the children. Can we have the children come forward? Kids for Mission Kids. Do we have some kids here? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Yeah. Simon, Spencer, and Frederick. I see some others there yet. They're afraid. Oh, we got some more coming. Yeah. All right. I think the older ones must be downstairs already. Good. Come on up. Yeah. Good. We're so glad you're here today. Yeah. You're going to have some fun with it. You want to step up here and then people can see you. You want to step up one? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. God, you, is that me? Do you know how much God loves you? Do you? Good, because a lot of adults have a hard time figuring that out. Yeah, so it's great that you guys know. Can you, can you show me how much? A lot? Okay. <laughs> I may have to change up this microphone here. Oh my goodness. Hang on. Are oh, you got me off? Let's try that. Okay. Nope. I'm having a time. Is it my glasses? Nope. Okay. Bethany, you have that other one? Turn me off there. Oops. Well, that's about the most wonderful thing that you can know is how much God loves you. And the most wonderful thing that we can continue to learn is to learn more about God and who we are in Him. Yes! There we go. Tell them, ready? <laughs> oh, well. Almost had it. Anyways, can I pray for you guys and then you can go downstairs? All right? And you can listen to your teachers and have a lot of fun? All right, let's bow our heads. Jesus, thank you so much that you express so clearly how much you love these young people. And we pray that they just continue to know through all the years how special you are to them, how important you are to them. So bless them and bless the time that they have to go downstairs right now. In the name of Jesus, we say amen. Down to your classrooms. Thank you, guys. Go ahead. There you go. All right, we have the ushers come forward and we'll continue in prayer. Most of you have probably seen the email. Um, Kay Basie had had a couple of uh, chemo treatments, but uh, the side effects, she didn't figure it was worth carrying on with that, so she's not going to take any more treatments at this point. Um, she's doing pretty good right now, though, uh, getting over some of those side effects, but we need to keep her in prayer. Sean Rand is hoping to come home soon, if a few things can be worked out in that way. Um, Edith Bishop will be moving to Norview uh, Nursing Home in Simcoe uh, on Tuesday. Then she'll be in quarantine for a few days, and then she'll be able to have uh, quite a few visitors, up to four at a time, I understand. Uh, continue to pray for Jack Bishop, though, too. Um, continue to pray for Donna Swick, who is recovering from surgery. And for Grace Link, uh, who's had a concussion, so we want to pray for her. Yeah, so let's do that now. Thank you, God, for your love for the children, and thank you that we can call ourselves your children also, Lord. What a wonderful thing. God, we lift up Kay to you, and of course, Phil too, and uh, we ask that you bless them greatly, Lord, and we are so thankful for them. 
Uh, we're so thankful for the, the lives of faith that they've lived and the, the way they exalt you in their lives. And we just pray for peace and strength for both of them, Lord. We pray for Sean. We pray the decision could be made very soon that he could come home and also that the healing continues and that he would be allowed to uh, have that operation he needs. Thank you for providing a place for Edith Bishop and uh, continue to help Jack as they're apart from each other. It's a, it's a lonely thing, Lord, but may they find their comfort and uh, all that they need in you. Please continue to heal uh, Donna Swick and, and for Grace Link too, where she's having uh, some side effects from this concussion. And we pray, Lord, that they would, they would go away very, very soon. And we also ask, Lord, that uh, you bless the uh, McNamara family. And uh, we ask also that you bless Laura as uh, she comes and she uh, shares with us um, the things of the Jewish tradition and, and the significance of Easter in this way, Lord. So we thank you. Lord, we pray that you would bless the offering you have given to us in a wonderful way. Uh, so much that we, we overflow, Lord, from that. But may we be giving back to you with cheerful and generous hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing this song.
sing it out, church. Yes, Laura, can we invite you to come up? Laura came in from Toronto. <laughs> Stay Having a few difficulties with our sound, okay. as you can see, yes. <laughs> anyways, yes, make, it wakes everybody up, though, too, that's so good. that's an advantage. I yeah. So, that. anyways. Thank you. Laura came in from Toronto this morning, her and her husband, uh, have three children. They're grown up at this point now. Okay. They don't leave home, but they're grown up. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Laura loves to uh, teach and talk and st uh, share the Bible with people. You have two degrees. I know you're both from California universities. Yeah. So okay. on days like this in Canada, I go, okay, Lord. <laughs> okay. <laughs> California. Right. Yeah. Yes. So the one is about missionary work in yeah. specifically the Jewish studies. Then. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. right. Very good. Well, we're excited to have you here today. Okay. We thank yeah. you. And uh, Lord bless you as you present to us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You can hear me okay, right? Let's hope there's no feedback. Okay, good. So shalom. shalom. Hey, that was really good. <laughs> you know how to make a nice Jewish girl feel right at home. <laughs> So a lot of times I say shalom, and people say, Laura, well, what does shalom mean exactly? Does it mean hello or goodbye or peace? It actually means all of those things, but it really works for me because I never know whether I'm coming or going, so shalom. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Laura, and I serve with Jews for Jesus for over 30 years now, and most of that time here in Canada. And a lot of times I tell people that I work with Jews for Jesus, and they look at me like I'm totally confused. They say, Laura, Jews for Jesus? That doesn't make any sense. It's an oxymoron. It's a contradiction in terms. It's like saying vegetarians for Big Macs or something. But if you really think about it, all the first followers of Jesus were Jewish, weren't they? All the writers of the New Testament were Jewish, with the possible exception of Luke. And well, he was a doctor, so you never know, he could have been Jewish. <laughs> but let's not forget that Jesus himself was Jewish. And if you really think about it, the biggest problem that we had in the first century wasn't Jews for Jesus, but Gentiles for Jesus. Do you remember that God had to tell Peter three times in a vision to go to the house of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, and tell him that he too could follow Jesus as his Messiah? Well, Peter finally got the message. He arrived at Cornelius' home. Cornelius received the word of God gladly, and then oy vey, we had problems. <laughs> because now Peter had to go back and tell all the other Jews for Jesus that now a Gentile wanted to follow Jesus too. We had to hold the very first church council meeting to decide on this burning issue of Gentiles for Jesus. But don't worry, we decided it was a good thing. You can read about it in Acts chapter 15, that Jews and Gentiles should worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob together with that middle wall of partition broken down once and for all. And we decided it was such a good thing, we sent you some of our best missionaries. We sent you Paul and Silas, Barnabas and Timothy, and they did such a fantastic job that now there are more of you than there are of us. <laughs> so if you were just a little bit curious, 
What we do at Jews for Jesus is get that gospel message back into the Jewish community and raise the banner that believing in Jesus is actually the most Jewish thing you could do because he really is the promised Messiah of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'll tell you a little bit more how we do that later, but this morning what I want to share with you is a really special presentation called Christ in the Passover. You see, if you were to ask any Jewish boy or girl who the hero of Passover is, after giving credit to the Lord, they're going to tell you Moses. And you see, that's true, but it's not quite the whole truth. Because if you were to ask any Jewish boy or girl who believes in Jesus who the hero of Passover is, they're going to tell you Jesus. And some of you might still be wondering, I mean, what exactly does Jesus have to do with the Passover? Passover is Jewish, right? Well, as I said, so was Jesus. And not only did he celebrate this Passover meal every single year while he dwelt among us on the earth, I think you're going to find he's clearly pictured in the story of Passover, as well as all of the symbols of Passover. Because if you really think about it, the story of Passover, it's the story of our liberation from bondage. And the message of Passover is the promise of redemption. So this morning, as I share with you this traditional Passover setting, it's really my hope that you're going to view it as more than just an explanation of a commemorative meal, but that you'll view it as I do, as an object lesson on the life and mission of the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sin of the world. So look closely this morning, because if you do, I think you'll find clearly pictured here his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. I'm getting a little feedback. Are you getting a little feedback back there? No? Okay, good. So if you brought your Bibles, why don't you just turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And I'm only going to read verses 7, 8, and 13 this morning, but I do encourage you in your own reading to you read at least the whole chapter, maybe um, all the way through to the end of the Gospel of Luke as you set your mind and your heart to prepare for the Easter season. But I'm going to read Luke 22, verses 7, 8, and 13. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to celebrate the Passover. And in verse 13, They left and found things, just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Now, the first day of Passover actually begins this seven-day holiday called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during this time, Jewish people don't eat anything which contains any yeast or leaven. Well, why no leaven? Some of you may have noticed that frequently throughout the scriptures, leaven is used as a symbol of sin. In ancient times, just a small piece of leaven was used to ferment the whole portion of dough. And as you know, it's the leaven which causes the dough to rise or to become puffed up, just as sin causes us to become puffed up in our own eyes. So for this time, we don't eat anything which contains any yeast or leaven as a way of saying that we want to break that daily sin cycle in our own lives. So in many Jewish homes, for six weeks prior to the Passover, and that's now, the house undergoes a complete spring cleaning. We remove any cakes, any cookies, any cereal, any bread, anything that has any leaven in it. And this usually is the work of the woman of the house. <laughs> but did you notice that Luke said Jesus sent two men to prepare the Passover? Now, perhaps it's because in Judaism, it's usually the man who has standing before God, not only when it comes to praying, but when it comes to ceremonial preparations as well. So if you really think about it, it should be the men who are doing the cleaning for this six weeks, don't you think? <laughs> don't worry, guys. <laughs> Our rabbis have come up with a solution to this very tricky problem. <laughs> you see, they say true, the house has been cleansed because the woman has removed every single speck of leaven. But you see, not quite every speck. She's taken a few crumbs and she's hidden them someplace in the house and it's up to the man to find them. 
So the night before Passover, the man comes home from work and takes up some very strange-looking cleaning tools, a feather, a wooden spoon, and a white cloth. And he goes on what we call in Hebrew, Berikat Chametz, the search for the leaven. So where could the crumbs be? They could be anywhere, behind the fridge, under the carpet, in the basement, up in the closet. They could be anywhere. But fortunately for him, his wife has been good enough to hide the crumbs the same place she hid them the year before. (laughs) And probably the year before that. So without too much difficulty, the man finds those crumbs. And with a steady hand, he sweeps those crumbs into the spoon with the feather. This is heavy house cleaning, don't you think, ladies? (laughs) Well, since the crumbs represent sin, the man's not permitted to touch them. Instead, he takes the whole thing, wraps it in the white cloth, and now he takes this down to a bonfire that's burning in the courtyard or the parking lot of the local synagogue. All the men of the community have gathered there, and each one throws this bundle of leaven into the flames. Now, if you happen to be in New York City at Passover, they don't have too many parking lots, so you'll see a lot of barbecues out in front of the buildings. (laughs) But now the man proudly returns home and says, now I have purged my house of all manner of leaven. Well, okay. But just to be sure, he adds one more prayer. May any manner of leaven which I've neither seen nor removed be considered null and void and dust of the earth. Amen. So the house has been cleansed. It's now ready for the Passover celebration. Now some of you may remember in the book of Exodus chapter 12 that the Israelites were instructed to eat that first Passover meal with their loins girded, their staves in their hand, and their sandals on their feet. Why? They were ready to go out of the land of Egypt at a moment's notice. But you see, today at Passover, we relax and recline on pillows. Because in ancient Near Eastern societies, only people who were free were allowed to recline at dinner, people who were already redeemed. Also, the head of the household wears special ceremonial garments. He wears a white robe, which is called a kittle, because in Judaism, white is the color which is worn by royalty. And some of you may have also noticed that Jewish men often cover their heads as a sign of respect before God. But you see, today at Passover, instead of that usual yarmulke or skullcap, the head of the household wears something a little more elaborate. He's wearing white robes and the symbol of a crown. A crown. Because you see, today at Passover, the head of the household is a king. And as a king, he's going to lead his family through the traditional Passover Seder. Now, Seder, it's a Hebrew word, which means order, because the Passover Seder follows a very specific order of events, which is recorded for us here in this book, which is called the Haggadah. The Haggadah, which literally means the telling, the telling of the story of Passover. There's an English side, don't worry. (laughs) Well, it looks like everything's about ready. There is a traditional saying at Passover, let all who are hungry come and eat. I really hope you weren't expecting me to serve you a whole Passover meal this morning. So you're going to have to use your imaginations. But the invitation stands. Let's use our imagination and celebrate the Passover together. Now the Passover begins with the lighting of the candles. And this usually is the duty and the honor of the woman of the house. After lighting the candles... She recites a traditional Hebrew blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech alam asher kedishanu b'mitzvotah v'zivanu lahad lech ner shel Pesach. Don't worry, I'll explain in English. You should see your faces right now. <laughs> Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us and commanded us to light the Passover candles. Now, it is significant for us that a woman lights these candles because our Messiah, who's called the light of the world, was promised to us not by seed of man, but by seed of woman and by the will of God. Just as the prophet Isaiah foretold, behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. Remember, she would call his name Emmanuel. He would be a light to light the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. Now, Passover, it's not just a meal. It is a banquet, 
And it's not just a service, it's a celebration. And whereas a meal or a service might only take an hour or two, this Passover Seder can take up to four long hours. Don't worry, we will not be here for four hours this morning. (laughs) But during this time, each adult who's sitting around the table is going to drink and refill his cup four times. The first cup is called the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification. The second cup is the cup of plagues, the cup of plagues. Now, in between this first and second cup is a time when the big Passover meal is served, and the cup which is taken after supper is the focal point of the entire ceremony. This is the cup of blessing, or the cup of redemption. And the fourth cup is the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. But it's with this first cup that the host is going to offer a blessing for the rest of the evening to follow. He holds that Kiddush cup aloft, and he thanks God Almighty, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Baruch atadonai lehen melchalam borei pri hagafen. Amen. So now the service has begun. At this point, the youngest child who's sitting around the table now steps forward, and he or she will ask the traditional four questions. Now, these questions are recorded for us in the Haggadah, and they're usually chanted. The first one goes like this. Which means, why is this night different from all the other nights? Why is this night different from all other nights? Well, those of us who know the story of Passover were obligated to respond. We would say, this is because of what the Lord has done for us. When he brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. You see, redemption, it's going to come up over and over and over again. Redemption, it's at the very heart of Passover. But Passover really imparts to us more than just God's message of redemption. It imparts to us God's means of redemption as well, through the sacrifice of Passover lambs. You remember the Israelites? They were instructed to take a whole, spotless lamb and roast it without breaking any of its bones. And then they were to take the blood of those lambs and apply it to the doorpost of their homes, first to the top and then to the two sides. Now, because of their obedience to God's command, they were spared that tenth plague that fell on the land of Egypt. You remember when the angel of death saw that blood on the doorpost of their homes, he was forced to pass over the houses of Israel. And that's where we get the name Passover. In Hebrew, the word is Pesach, the time which commemorates when death literally passed over the houses of Israel because of the blood the blood of the lamb. What a mighty act of redemption. But still, what a picture for us today, isn't it, of an even greater redemption that was to come through the sacrifice of another spotless Passover lamb. You see, just as none of the bones of those first Passover lambs were broken, so too not one of Jesus' bones was broken in his death. And just as the Israelites had to apply in faith the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of their home, so too must we, each and every one of us, apply in faith the blood of Jesus to the doorposts of our hearts. Well, now the child steps forward and asks the second question. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? And we would respond, this is because our ancestors in their haste to leave Egypt had to leave while their bread was still flat. This is what we call a matzah tosh. It's a pouch containing three layers of matzah or unleavened bread, and each is separated by a small piece of cloth. Now at this point in the service, the father removes the middle layer of matzah, recites a blessing, and breaks it in two. He sets one half aside, And the other half, he gives a very special name. He calls this the Afikomen. Afikomen. Try saying that with me. Afikomen. Good, you all speak Greek. (laughs) Afikomen is actually a Greek word. It's not a Hebrew word. And it literally means dessert or that which comes after. And that's what the father does at this point. Kind of a strange thing. He takes the Afikomen and he wraps it in a white cloth. And then he buries it 
It's hidden from view. But later on, the service cannot continue until one of the children finds the afikomen and brings it back to the father where he redeems it at a price. I actually think it may have been the first century Jewish followers of Jesus who instituted this tradition. That may be why it's a Greek word, but I think you'll see more why I believe that later. And now the child steps forward and asks those final two questions. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs and why do we dip in salt water twice? Now I'm going to explain by showing you this. This is what we call Salah Shel Pesach. It's a Passover plate and a symbolic piece of food from the Passover meal is placed in each one of these compartments. And each one literally paints the picture of redemption for us. Now the first piece of food is what we call karpas or greens. Usually we take parsley or lettuce and these greens, they represent springtime and life. But before we can eat them, we're commanded to dip them into salt water, which represents the tears of life. You see, this food is supposed to remind us that life without redemption is simply life immersed in tears. And this is what we call chatzeret. Chatzeret. Usually we take an onion or a horseradish root. And this food simply serves to remind us that the root of life is bitter, as it certainly was for the Israelites while they were in bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. And this is what we call maror. Maror. It's the root of the bitter herb itself. It's freshly ground horseradish. Now the Haggadah instructs us that each one of us sitting around the table must eat a tablespoonful of horseradish. <laughs> Have you ever mistaken wasabi for something else? Same thing. <laughs> you cry, right? <laughs> you have no choice in the matter. It's a battle between the horseradish and your sinuses. Horseradish always wins. We call this Jewish Dristan. <clears throat> but there is a serious side to the tears. You see, the tears, they're supposed to remind us how bitter Life is without what? Redemption, right. You got it. By way of contrast to that bitter herb, this is what we call charoset. Charoset, usually we take chopped apples, honey, nuts, raisins. We would mix it into a paste. And this food serves to remind us of the mortar, uh, the cement that the Israelites use while making bricks for Pharaoh. And the question might come up, well, why are we using such a sweet and delicious mixture to represent such a bitter toil, such a bitter labor? Well, the Haggadah tells us that even the bitterest of labor is sweetened with the promise of redemption, right? Usually we make a brick for Pharaoh out of the maror and the charoset to remind us between two pieces of matzah the bitterness of slavery and the sweetness of the promise of redemption. It actually tastes really good, but maybe I'm just used to it. <laughs> and this is what we call a chagiga. It's not an Easter egg. Before the service, we would take a white egg and we would roast it until it turns brown. You see, chagiga was the name given to those special sacrifices that were made in the temple at Passover time. And in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed, and along with it, the altar on which the sacrifices were made. So the Chagiga is a symbol of grief to our people, grief over the destruction of the second temple. But also contained within the egg is a symbol and the promise of hope and new life. So as we break this egg up and pass a piece to each person at the table, they dip it into salt water, which represents what? Tears to remind us the symbol of grief over the destruction of the temple. Now the final item on the plate, it's the strangest one of all. It's not a piece of food, it's a bone, the shank bone of a lamb. You see, Passover, it's often called the feast of the Passover lamb. But you see, today at Passover, no lamb is served because the lamb that was eaten were those special sacrifices that were made in the temple at Passover. And as I, as I said, the temple was destroyed. So really, the presence of those final two items, the egg and the bone, they're only there to remind us of sacrifices which are no longer made. 
So the question might come up, well, <laughs> with no temple or altar, with no sacrifices to be made on our behalf, how is redemption possible? Because the law of Moses clearly states that he has given it to us on the altar to make atonement for our souls. For it is the blood by reason of life which makes for atonement. And many people, both Jewish and Gentile, might say, perhaps that was relevant 2,000 years ago, but it couldn't have any bearing on our lives today, could it? Well, couldn't it? Why does the Haggadah tell us that each one of us sitting around the table at Passover must take the story of Passover personally, as if each and every one of us was being redeemed out of the land of Egypt personally? I think we need to take the story of Passover personally because each and every one of us needs to be redeemed personally. But with no sacrifices to be made on our behalf, with no Lamb of God, how is redemption possible? Well, once, nearly 2,000 years ago, there lived a man named Yochanan, Yochanan Hamatbil. You might know him better as John, John the Baptist. And one day, while he was baptizing in the Jordan River, his gaze fell on another Jewish man. And you remember what he cried. <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sin of the world. That's how not through the sacrifice of Passover lambs, but through the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. Now it's time to drink from the second cup, the cup of plagues. Now in Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy. You may notice if you go in a Jewish home, there's a saucer under the cup, and they keep pouring until it overflows the edge. You may have read about that in the Psalms. But at this point in the service, our joy is not complete. So we actually pour out some of the contents of this cup 10 times as a way of remembering those 10 plagues that were poured out upon the land of Egypt. You see, we mourn their loss. We express sorrow over the destruction of the Egyptians. But I do think there's an important lesson for us in the cup of plagues. You see, Pharaoh defied the will of God, didn't he? He was repeatedly told by Moses what God wanted him to do, let my people go, and yet he refused. And because of his disobedience, death and destruction were poured out not only upon his land, but upon his own home as well. He lost his own son due to his hardness of heart. So if I can give you just one little piece of Jewish wisdom this morning, is if God's telling you to do something, just, just do it. It's a good idea. <laughs> But as I said, really, Passover, it's a night of rejoicing, and it's a night to praise God. And today at Passover, we really can praise God, can't we? The angel of death really did pass over the houses of Israel. And we can praise God because the Israelites, they really were redeemed out of the land of Egypt. But more importantly, we can praise God because those of us who know him have been redeemed from an even greater bondage through him. Through our faith in the Messiah Jesus, we too, each and every one of us, can literally pass over from death unto life. Amen? Now, between the second and the third cup, I'm supposed to serve you a huge meal, and I promise you're eating for well over an hour. <laughs> but instead, I'm going to take like a, a few minutes, a break, to tell you a little bit more about the ministry of Jews for Jesus. When you leave, you may notice that I have a connect table out there with some free resources. Please take what you'd like to know to read more about the ministry of Jews for Jesus. I have some not so free stuff out there, so if you want some of that, you kind of have to see me first. But I will um, recommend to you a book uh, called Christ in the Passover that goes into a lot more detail than I could go this morning on the history of Passover, the culture surrounding it, how it was celebrated in Jesus' day, how it's celebrated today. A really good resource for you. Our latest one in the feast series is Christ in the Sabbath. Also a really good resource for you. Um, also some free um, newsletters and, and uh, literature. This one's on the fall feasts of Israel. All of the feasts actually in Leviticus 23, um, the whole biblical calendar, points to an entire theme of redemption throughout the scriptures. So this is just like one small insight into one of the feasts. But I'm going to take a short break and show you a few minute video now, Cindy Will, on um, the ministry of Jews for Jesus and how we do what we do. Jesus seemed like he could be the Messiah, but I'm Jewish. 
person said to me, have you ever heard of Jews for Jesus? As a Jewish person, when I started to follow Jesus, people would question if you're still Jewish, if you believe in Jesus. What I wish someone had told me when I first came to faith in Jesus is that I could have a thriving Jewish identity and a thriving faith in Jesus together and not have to choose between the two. The reality is, all of the first believers in Jesus were Jewish. They saw him as the promise of the Messiah. I want to invite you to join Jews for Jesus as we relentlessly pursue God's plan for the salvation of the Jewish people. Most Jewish people in the world have never heard the gospel, and together we get to change that. You make it possible for me as a missionary to engage with not yet believing Jewish people and to tell them that God loves them. And in a sense, it's not really us doing it, it's Him doing it. We're just the ones who are carrying the message. Go and tell. That's what Jews for Jesus is best known for. It's that proclamation of the gospel out on the streets, meeting one to one. Come and see. And that is where we invite Jewish people to come into an environment, a community, a small group, a Bible study, and they can see the dynamic of a vibrant community of Jewish believers in Jesus. Love and serve. There's so many needs. And so we go out there lovingly feeding people, even as Jesus fed and met needs, and it opens people up to the gospel. Through your support, we can show Jewish people how beautiful God is, how beautiful Jesus is, and how beautiful the gospel is. Every week around the world, Jews for Jesus welcomes new Jewish brothers and sisters into the family of Messiah. I'm so thankful for people like you who love the Jewish people and want them to see who Jesus is. If your heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, you're going to find yourself loving the same things that God loves. You're going to enter into His passion for His people. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that we've been waiting for. All that the Jewish prophets have talked about, all that God has spoken to us, every Jewish person deserves to hear the truth about Jesus. We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Come and see. So you get a bit of a visual of, of all the cities we are in the world, right, as you know, with um, what's going on in Ukraine, we've had to relocate a lot of our uh, missionary staff, their families, the men have stayed behind. Um, we've also sent a lot of our Russian-speaking missionaries from other places, from Israel. Um, they're helping refugees across the border, taking care of them in Poland, and making way for them to go to Israel um, to live for the foreseeable future. So. We really do covet your prayers for them, for what's going on, for protection for the whole country, for the family of God, and that God will also use these, this situation to bring many to him. One thing I can tell you is uh, one of our missionaries from Tel Aviv was driving 14 people across the border and sharing the gospel with them as they were fleeing Ukraine. And all 14 of them came to receive Jesus as their Messiah in the van as they drove across. So things are happening, bright spots in the darkness for the Lord. And that really is why we cover your prayers. You'll notice um, you have some cheat sheet notes in this Christ in the Passover bulletin. I don't expect you to remember everything that I said this morning, so it's kind of an outline. But this part tears off. And we're going to be taking a special offering for the work of Jews for Jesus after I speak. So if you'd like to give, you can do that. I just need to remind you that Jews for Jesus, we're not a church and we're not a substitute for one. And we firmly believe you need to give to your church first. And if you do give gifts to ministries like ours, it's something that's above and beyond your regular tithes and offerings. But if you want to give, um, please put the amount on there. We'll properly thank you and receipt you with your information. 
You don't have to give a gift to keep in touch with us. Put your email down. If you prefer snail mail, we'll send you um, a newsletter in the mail. We don't inundate your mailbox. We don't write that fast. <laughs> so you won't be getting tons of e-blasts and tons of newsletters. We all get too much email. But if you want to know specifically how to pray for us and what's going on in the world, I will tell you, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that for the past five years, God has called me to lead a team reaching out to Haredi women. That's ultra-Orthodox Jewish women. Probably Jewish people are an unreached people group around the world, but the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox Jews, are the most unreached of the unreached people. Um, an in incredibly closed community and very gospel resistant. So I would covet your prayers as we um, look to connect with these Haredi women and share the gospel with them, mostly through our love and serve anchor and trying to meet with them and connect with them because of what Jesus has done for us. So please do pray for me. Please do stay in touch with us. The most important thing is that we're all involved in some way in reaching out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Amen? Amen. You guys full? Those with the biggest imaginations are stuffed <laughs> because now you've been eating for over an hour, you are really reclining, all the dishes have been cleared away, and now it's time for the third cup, the cup taken after supper, the cup of redemption. So this is the focal point of the entire ceremony, but we can't go on. Remember earlier something was broken and then it was buried, it now needs to be brought back before we can continue. Does anyone remember what it was called? We said it all together. Short-term memory. Don't worry, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> it was the afikomen, right? That's okay. One time someone said, oh yeah, the avocado, the avocado. I think they were thinking about lunch. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's now brought back to the father where he takes it. He's redeemed it at a price. Remember, one of the children has brought it to him. One time my nephew found it. He negotiated hard for a puppy. Didn't get a puppy, so he tried for a bike. He ended up with $5. That's usually the going rate. <laughs> but it's now brought back to the father where he takes it and unwraps it. And then he breaks it again and again and again. He breaks it into many small olive-sized pieces. And this is taken along with the cup of redemption. Does this look familiar, brothers and sisters? It ought to. <laughs> this is the origin of our communion service. And where else do we get a clearer picture of our Messiah than in the tradition of the Afikomen? The middle layer, which is removed, broken, wrapped in a white cloth, buried, redeemed, and brought back to the Father. But we can see him not only in the afikomen, but in the matzah as well, which is unleavened. You remember, unleavening speaks of sin sinless nature. So this is also a picture of Jesus for us. And you should know that for matzah to be found suitable for use at Passover, our rabbis have laid down very specific regulations concerning its appearance. First of all, it must be striped to prevent the appearance of leavening. Can you see that? This is a symbol for us. It's a picture, an image, because Jesus was striped. Just as the prophet Isaiah foretold almost 700 years before he came, that it would be by his stripes that we are healed. Also, to prevent that appearance of leavening or bubbling up, the matzah must be pierced. And you see that through the flame. This is also a picture for us, a symbol, an image, because Jesus was pierced, wasn't he? Just as the prophet Zechariah foretold almost 600 years before he came, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. But we can see him not only in the matzah, but in the pouch as well. Remember, we have three layers of unleavened bread, each separated by a small piece of cloth. Now, there's been much disagreement amongst our rabbis concerning the meaning of this mysterious unity, this mysterious three-in-one. Some rabbis say perhaps the unity of the matzotosh represents the unity of the three patriarchs of Israel, the unity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why is the middle layer broken, buried, and then brought back? Nobody knows. Other rabbis say, well, perhaps the unity of the matzotosh represents the unity of the three divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom, the unity of the priests, the Levites, and the children of Israel. But why is that middle layer broken, buried, and then brought back? Nobody knows. 
But why even search for explanations? Why not just accept the explanation that's so clearly given in the design of the pouch itself? There are three layers there, but they represent a unity, a triunity. And a Hebrew word, which may mean such a unity, is the Hebrew word echad, echad, which brings to mind the word of God spoken by Moses in Deuteronomy when he cries out, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the word for one is unity. Remember, at that point in the service, the father removes the middle layer of unity while the other two remain hidden from view. You remember in John's gospel, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh. He became visible. He dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But to those who received him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. So we Jews who know the Messiah believe that the unity of the Matzatash represents the unity of one God revealed in three persons. I bet you could say this with me. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Why is the middle layer broken, buried, and then brought back? I believe because Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, was broken, buried, and then brought back. This is my body, he said which was broken for you, for you, for you, for all of us. Do this, he said, in remembrance of me. Now we've eaten the bread. It's time to drink from the cup of redemption. Now the fruit of the vine at Passover is usually red. Our rabbis say to remind us of the shed blood of those first Passover lambs. You remember their blood was shed in order to redeem to buy back the children of Israel out of bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. Well, in the same way, the blood of another Passover lamb was shed, wasn't it? The blood of Jesus in order to redeem us, to buy us back out of bondage and slavery to sin and death. It was concerning this cup, the third cup, the cup taken after supper, that Jesus said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. That new covenant promised to us hundreds of years earlier through the prophet Jeremiah in the 31st chapter of his book when he cries, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob, not like the covenant which I made with your forefathers in the days when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. But this is the covenant I will make with them, says the Lord. After those days, I will put my law within them. On their hearts, I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the cup of redemption taken along with Afikomen as a reminder of shed blood and the bodies of those first Passover lambs. If you don't remember anything else here this morning, just remember that our Passover lamb is Jesus been four hours on speed. What, double speed? Is that how you listen to podcasts now? <laughs> it's been four hours. We told the whole story of Passover. We've read through the whole Haggadah. We've recounted the great and mighty deeds of God. And naturally, our hearts are filled with praise and thanksgiving. All that he did for us, all the miracles that he wrought for us in parting the Red Sea, bringing us through the desert with a pillar of cloud by day and a fire by night, providing manna, bringing us into the promised land. So we turn with hearts full of praise to this fourth cup, the cup of Hallel or the cup of praise. As you know, you all know another Hebrew word besides Shalom. It's Hallelujah, means praise the Lord. Comes from the Hebrew root word Hallel, which means to praise. And this is the cup of praise. You might remember from reading the gospel account of Jesus and his disciples at the table, when they left the table, they were singing psalms of praise. They had partaken of the cup of praise and gone through the Hallel Psalms, which are recorded in the Haggadah. Those are Psalms 113 through 118, and they're read in their entirety. So that's the reference to the cup of praise. But there's one last cup, which I haven't told you about. This is a cup from which no one drinks. This is the cup of Elijah, the cup of Elijah. Now you see in many Jewish homes, an entire place setting is set for the prophet Elijah. 
Why this longing for the prophet? Some of you might remember from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, it says that the coming of the Messiah would be preceded by the coming of the prophet Elijah. So at this point in the service, the youngest child goes to the door, opens it into the night air, hoping that Elijah will accept the invitation. He'll come in, he'll sit down, he'll eat from his plate, he'll drink from his cup, thereby announcing the coming of the Messiah. Now, when they did this in my husband's home, his younger sister would go to the door, and he used to watch the cup really carefully, waiting for the wine to go down. <laughs> Thought Elijah was a ghost. But it never did. But then again, we know Elijah has come, don't we? Jesus said of John the Baptist, if you care to believe it, he himself is Elijah, the one who was to come. So the prophet, the forerunner, has come, and so has the Messiah. And we might be sitting here this morning going, wow, that's so amazing. Look how God has revealed himself through people and history and scripture and symbols. I don't know if I'd call it nice. Maybe if someone goes to the store and picks you up a liter of milk, you can call that nice. But God didn't do us a favor. He redeemed us out of bondage and slavery to sin and death. That is not just nice. That is amazing grace. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Avinu Malkeinu B'Shemayim, our Heavenly Father and King, we do come into your presence with hearts filled with awe and thanksgiving. We remember that you not only redeemed us out of bondage and slavery in Egypt, but we sit here today redeemed out of bondage to sin and death through the blood of your own Son. And as we are mindful that it is his blood on the doorposts of our hearts, and that we have received this free gift of eternal life, we pray that we would freely share it with others and give you the praise that's due your name. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach Sar Shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Wow, thank you, Laura. That was tremendous. That was great how it all just ties in. Wonderful. Could we have the ushers come forward, please? We're going to take a love offering for Jews for Jesus. Let us pray. King of the universe, you have redeemed us. Our hearts overflow with joy. And we want to give back to you. We want to give to your ministry. We want people to know. We want the Jewish people to know you are the Messiah, the one and only. So thank you and bless this time. Multiply this offering in the name of Jesus. Amen. Search the world, it couldn't fill me. Man's empty phrase, treasures the fear, never enough. You came along, put me back together. And you still call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You 
turn morning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn morning to dancing Shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways Laura's going out to the resource table, so take a moment and see uh, all the different resources that she has there. Um, remember the meeting right after the service. It'll be happening very quickly. If you're really hungry and you need to go for lunch, we got something here for you to eat anyway, so don't, that's not an excuse, okay? All right, so we've been here to worship and to praise. Now we go out and serve and reach out to the world. All right. Blessings. <laughs>